Well, thanks everybody. And the uh, first thing I need to, first person I need to thank is Gary for setting the scene for me this morning. Uh, you did it very eloquently, Gary. Um, our presentations are very, very similar uh, titles, but hopefully this uh, presentation uh, takes it, uh, hopefully, a, a, a bit in a different direction to, to the presentation where, where um, Gary did it this morning. So I call this uh, Welcome to the Anthropocene, and uh, the thinking behind this is, you know, if this wasn't the party you subscribed to, well, too bad, because this is where we are, and we're going to have to uh, deal with it. So this is um, a, a map of uh, where, what the Earth looked like about a thousand years before present. So this is the transformation, and, and we see a uh, significant transformation already in India and some parts of the East as well as Europe. And as we step through this, we see an increasing transformation of the Earth's surface uh, to where we are at the moment. And um, so the statistics are that about 43% of the Earth's surface has been transformed. In the last glacial period, about 30% of the Earth's surface was transformed through that glacial period. So this is a significant impact on this uh, uh, on the planet that we live on. And uh, so in terms of the theme of mainstreaming, I uh, provocatively put out uh, the subtitle there of uh, Beyond Mainstreaming. And perhaps we need to be thinking beyond mainstreaming. And given the urgency of what we're dealing with, that perhaps we need to be thinking about systems transitions. Uh, not to say that mainstreaming isn't important, but perhaps we need to think even further than, than, um, than uh, mainstreaming. So every couple of years, a WWF the organization that I work for uh, uh, puts this thing out, they call the Living Planet Report. We're a very optimistic bunch, so we call it the Living Planet Report. Um, I refer to it rather jokingly as, as the Dying Planet Report because uh, you know, the, the, the graphs and the trajectories of the, of the graphs are quite clear that uh, <coughs> the, the health of the planet is decreasing, the footprint where we are sitting at the moment, the global ecological footprint is 50% 50 uh, exceeding the carrying capacity of the planet. And a term that you hear, if you'll excuse the sort of uh, militaristic uh, way of putting it, but a term that I hear a lot within WWF is, you know, we're celebrating a lot of wins, we're winning a lot of battles, and recently we had another excellent um, reason to celebrate in South Africa. Um, but we hear this this term, we're winning battles, we're losing the war. So we win things on the ground, but this uh, graph just continues steadily going uh, in the wrong direction. So how do we change the trajectory of these graphs? Perhaps we need a, a bigger intervention. So we heard a bit about the planetary boundaries, and this is one way of looking at it. And Rockstrom put out these uh, nine planetary boundaries, of which seven are there. Uh, what was interesting for me was the follow-on to this work by Bonaski, where he uh, looked at, well, firstly, he was saying that, you know, there are uh, evidence for state shifts in some of these boundaries. So we started to already see state shifts in some of these uh, boundaries. But he started looking at solutions, and he said there are four things that we need to do as a society if we want to avert these uh, state shifts. First thing is to stabilize population and reduce consumption. The second thing is to increase the efficiency of food production. Third thing is increase uh, non-fossil fuel energy production, so wean ourselves of fossil fuel uh, dependency. And the fourth thing is to manage the reservoirs of biodiversity. So these are four big things, and he he puts uh, he, he he recognizes that these are massive changes that will take decades uh, to realize. But it's not only the scientists that are thinking about it every couple of years, or actually every year the World Economic Forum puts out their Global Systemic Risk Report. <coughs> One of the big systemic risks that are affecting us as a globe, and that could have knock-on effects uh, throughout uh, our system. And if we, if we zoom into the top eight, which is sitting up in the, in the top quarter uh, up over here, if we zoom into those, uh, we see that five of the top eight are related to the environment. Water supply crisis comes out right on top here. <coughs> we have a failure of climate adaptation, volatility in energy and agricultural prices, which is related to the environment, food shortage uh, crisis, and rising greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, five of the top eight, and I would venture to say that these are also linked into those uh, systemically. 
So the economic community is recognizing the systemic nature of these risks. A third way of looking at this is not from a boundaries or a systemic risk point of view, but from a resource limitation point of view. And this is some of the work that's been done by um, the McKinsey Group. And so if we look at food price index going from the 90s, we see this massive spike that's related to uh, food supply issues and volatility in, in price, which is affecting uh, society. So for instance, this spike over here resulted in 44 million people being driven into poverty just because they can't So massive spikes in this food price volatility which is affecting the global social dynamics uh, uh, at a very fundamental level. And the McKinsey Group drew this graph that had a commodity index. And the interesting thing about this is that from uh, the turn of the century, the uh, 20th century, what we've seen is a slow deep uh, um, uh, uh, prices have decreased for, for basic commodities. And this is related to increased efficiency in product uh, production. Um, and I would add to that unaccounted uh, externalities in that process that have driven down commodity prices over the last uh, century. But once we hit uh, the, to the millennium, we saw a massive change here which eroded all those decreases in commodity prices in a, in a matter of a decade. And this is related to uh, supply side issues. So they concluded that uh, the drivers of this, um, of this unprecedented volatility, there were five main drivers, three billion middle class consumers that have to enter, uh, that, that uh, will enter the middle class over the next 20 years, New sources of supply are becoming increasingly challenging. Uh, these resources are also increasingly linked. So the water, energy, food, uh, uh, nexus is what they're referring to. Um, and extraction has impacts on ecosystems that are essential to humans and is growing concern about inequality. So these are the main drivers that are driving this volatility. The McKinsey report went on to say that 75% of the productivity gains can be met through 15 responses. And I have summarized those 15 responses into four main areas here. Energy production and consumption, food production and waste, smart urbanization uh, and uh, transport, and then finally reducing land degradation. They costed this out at about 900 billion Ran to, to make this transition to meet these resource uh, requirements. And that's an interesting number because you'll remember the Stern report came up with a number of around 700 billion for tackling uh, climate change. So that's an interesting number. In my view, the fundamental challenge that we're dealing with here is uh, needing to move from an industrial based civilization into a civilization which is more ecologically based. And these are terms, they need definitions. What do I mean by that? Industrial civilization is one which is based on extracting value, and normally few people will uh, accumulate that value at the expense of others, as well as a large amount of externalities. So industrial civilization is not accounted for externalities. Uh, ecological civilization is not accounted for such externalities. By and large, industrial civilization is not operated in a way that is aware of boundaries. In most cases, the uh, resource constraints have been met by uh, exporting the requirements to other parts of the world. So we've seen as the resources reach limits in Europe, these, uh, the footprint was then exported to Africa and other developing countries. So to date, it has not uh, operated in a way that is aware of boundaries. And finally, uh, it's operated in a very linear, disconnected disconnected way. So it's a fundamental transition uh, in my view. Now, transitions can be tricky. Um, you need to do two things in a transition. Firstly, you need to play by the existing rules and preserve the fundamentals of the system that you're in. Then you need to change the rules at the same time. And I think of the economic transition of South Africa as a, as a key example of that. Following the social and political transformation of South Africa, it was a need to maintain the fundamentals of the economy whilst at the same time transforming the economy. And many of you will know that that part is not complete by any means. That most of the wealth still sits in uh, previously advantaged communities or white communities. So it just illustrates the strength of some of these lock-ins that uh, these systems can be in and how difficult they are to actually change. 
So you need basically a defensive uh, game plan as well as an attacking game plan. You need a defensive game plan to defend the fundamentals that you need, taking it into the new system and an attacking game plan to change the things that you need to change. So WWF at an international level, this is our conceptual model of how we're going to change the trajectory of those curves. And there are five things we say that we need to do. We need to preserve the natural capital, and that's the defensive game plan. Uh, and then we need to change some things. We need to produce better, we need to consume more wisely, we need to redirect financial flows, and we need to develop more equitable resource governance mechanisms. So these are five big things that need to be undertaken. So as I said, the top part is about playing by the existing rules. This part is about complete systems transitions, changing the rules completely by which we play this game. So how do we change the game? This is some of the thinking, and this is by no means uh, we say that we, we, we know all the answers. This is just an illustration of some of the thinking within WWE at a global level. How do we produce better? We've got about one billion producers, farmers, fishermen, fisher folk. Uh, at this side, we've got about six billion uh, consumers on this side. Uh, and we refer to this as our uh, champagne glass model. Uh, because about 75, 70% 70 of the choices that are made by consumers are directed by 300 com companies um, globally. So there's an increased concentration around big multinational brands. We've been able to further uh, focus this down to 100 companies that uh, control uh, most of the choices that are important to the biodiversity um, places that we're working in. So through doing this, what we're trying to do is create tipping points. So we believe in our market transformation work is that if we can develop commodity standards, so the rules by which commodities are produced, we can ensure that financial investments are going to the right places to finance that change, and we can engage strategically with individual companies to help uh, this change happen. Then we can create some of these tipping points in commodity markets. So whilst you might focus on the 100 or the 300, the tipping point creates uh, a change for, for everybody. If we look at redirecting financial flows, we've got about 3, 3 billion economically active people globally uh, between the age of 15 and 65. Uh, financial, global financial assets are about $200 trillion. If we look at some of the big players, pension funds, global pension funds, there are three, $30 trillion in global pension funds. This is your and my money. This is not anybody else's money. This is money that we can control as global citizens. Insurance industry, once again, a big industry, and I think uh, Belinda's going to touch on this industry and some of our uh, innovative work that we've been doing with that industry. Uh, and very closely linked to climate change. About $25 trillion sitting in that industry. And finally, the top 10 banks globally control about $26 trillion. So if you take that combined, you're about $80 trillion, uh, $85 trillion, somewhere around there. So if one was able to just redirect 1% of these assets, you're getting quite close to the um, $900 billion that the McKinsey report uh, spoke of. So these are some of the numbers and some of the ways I think which we need to be thinking about where are the focal points, where are the leverage points in these systems and how do we transition them. If we talk about consuming more wisely, this is a local example of our sustainable seafood initiative. Um, and uh, we have an SMS service. This is hourly um, SMS uh, uh, traffic to our SMS service and you can see these uh, peaks at lunchtime and summertime. Uh, about 170,000 SMSs is the total amount of traffic that's gone through this. So that's 170,000 choices that have been affected. 80% of our target markets say that they do listen to it and they actually change what they eat uh, based on this. So a very successful way of, of illustrating how we can influence uh, consumption. And then finally, this is the, the killer crunch I think Brian was talking about this morning, equitable resource governance. This is a, a very difficult one to crack, but I think I just want to touch on one point here. And this is about moving beyond nationalism and towards a more globally engaged citizenry. And I, I use an example of an organization that I have a lot of respect for, 
advice. This is their campaign against Monsanto. I just pulled it off. If I'd known there was a talk about bees, I would have got their, their Save the Bees campaign. But they've got 1.5 million uh, supporters for this campaign. They've got a million supporters in just 36 hours. Um, they've got 21 million supporters globally. And uh, you know, this is, they, they refer to it as people-powered politics and taking uh, politics to, uh, to the people. So these are some of the illustrations of some of the things I think we need to be thinking about in terms of systems transition. But finally, you know, system-wide system -wide transitions are not uh, simple. They are a whole bunch of markets, economies of scale, sunk investments, infrastructure competencies, a whole bunch of things that you, you will be aware of. I want to stop a little bit on this uh, rather complex uh, graph and talk you through this quickly. This is about systems transition, and it's a researcher called, uh, I think he's uh, pronounced his surname Kills, he's dashed in origin, working uh, from the University of Manchester. The interesting thing about this is firstly, technical uh, systems transition. So landscape scale, a regime, and uh, innovation. This is where the locking happens in this regime, regime. So you can see this is where culture, science, technology, industry, policy comes together. And that's your lock-in. And that's what you, you need to be thinking about. And typically what happens is the landscape will disrupt that uh, existing regime to create what is referred to as uh, window of an op windows of opportunity. And you'll see a whole bunch of arrows starting to go all over the place and finally coming together. So this is creating windows of opportunity through disruption of the existing regime. At the same time, what the landscape does, it influences innovation at the lower level. And this uh, results in a whole bunch of innovations once again all over the place and finally coming together. And when those innovations are able to then, uh, sorry, one point before I get there, it's important to note that your existing socio-technical regime is going to be putting the brakes on this. This is going to be your lock-in. It's going to prevent these innovations from taking hold. Finally, if you get uh, traction there, you'll get your innovations moving up into your uh, windows of opportunity and finally your, your new norm uh, being developed. I think this is very important. It's quite a simple, uh, simplistic <laughs> model of change uh, once you get your head around it, but very important when we're thinking about systems transitions. Van uh, Jankerken goes on to say that there are four main types of transition and it relates a bit to the model we previously. First of all, there's the reorientation of trajectories. And I would, I would say that this is mainly where we're thinking about in terms of mainstreaming. This is where you've got very strong lock-ins and le relatively low levels of coordination. And typically will lead to incremental change. So some change in the trajectory um, of this uh, regime over here. So you have a slight change in this, re uh, this regime. The second is an endogenous renewal. This is where there's high levels of coordination and innovation uh, allows certain parts of the system to change faster than others. So this is typically where you get something from a bottom-up uh, situation, you get endogenous renewal. The third one is emergent transformations where there's strong external pressures leading <coughs> to windows of opportunities. The fourth one is purposive uh, transition. This is sort of the, the Chinese example where I think we've got a population uh, problem, one child, finish, uh, let's go, move on, uh, um, <laughs> top-down uh, transitions. And I think these are, these are important to think about in these systems. Which systems are pervasive and which ones are the ones that we need to engage and how do we engage in these systems uh, transitions? So finally, I leave you with uh, every, those who know me, every, pick, every uh, presentation has got to have one surfing slide. And, uh, <laughs> So I leave you with a challenge of, you know, let, let's get radical, let's think beyond mainstreaming, let's think about global systems transitions, how can we engineer some of the, the changes that we require at the scale that we require to meet uh, some of these global challenges. Thank you.